in which growing maturity rekindles the relationship between one pair of lovers, and self-absorption carries another pair to the brink of death. Chapter 10 Pesov liked to argue to the end, and was not satisfied with Sergei Ivanovitch's words, the less so as he sensed the incorrectness of his own opinion. "'I never meant population density alone,' he said over the soup, addressing Alexey Alexandrovitch, "'but as combined with fundamentals, and not with principles. "'It seems to me,' Alexey Alexandrovitch replied unhurriedly and listlessly, that they are one and the same thing. In my opinion, only that nation which is more highly developed can influence another which... But that's just the question, Pesov interrupted in his bass voice, always in a hurry to speak and always seeming to put his whole soul into what he said. What is this higher development supposed to be? The English, the French, the Germans, which of them stands in a higher level of development? Which will nationalize the other? We see the Rhine Vrenchified, yet the Germans are not on a lower level, he cried. There's a different law here. It seems to me that the influence always comes from the side of true education, Alexei Alexandrovich said, raising his eyebrows slightly. But what should we take as signs of true education? Pesov said. I suppose that these signs are known, said Alexey Alexandrovitch. Are they fully known? Sergey Ivanovitch put in with a subtle smile. It is now recognized that a true education can only be a purely classical one, yet we see bitter disputes on one side and the other, and it cannot be he denied that the opposing camp has strong arguments in its favor. You are a classicist, Sergei Ivanovich. May I pour you some red? said Stepan Arkadyevich. I'm not expressing my opinion about either sort of education, Sergei Ivanovich said with a smile of condescension, as if to a child, and held out his glass. I'm merely saying that there are strong arguments on both sides, he went on, turning to Alexey Alexandrovitch. I received a classical education, but personally I can find no place for myself in this dispute. I see no clear arguments for preferring classical studies over the modern. The natural sciences have as much pedagogical and developmental influence, Pesov picked up. Take astronomy alone. Take botany or zoology, with its system of general laws. I cannot fully agree with that, Alexey Alexandrovitch replied. It seems to me that one cannot but acknowledge the fact that the very process of studying the forms of languages has a particularly beneficial effect upon spiritual development. Besides, it cannot be denied that the influence of classical writers is moral in the highest degree, whereas the teaching of the natural sciences is unfortunately combined with those harmful and false teachings that constitute the bane of our time. Sergei Ivanovich was about to say something, but Pesov, with his dense bass, interrupted him. He heatedly began proving the incorrectness of this opinion. Sergei Ivanovich calmly waited his turn, obviously ready with a triumphant retort. Yet, said Sergei Ivanovich, 
turning to Karenin with a subtle smile. One cannot but agree that it is difficult to weigh fully all the advantages and disadvantages of both branches of learning, and the question of preference would not have been resolved so quickly and definitively if there had not been on the side of classical education that advantage you just mentioned, its moral or disenlement, anti-nihilistic influence. Undoubtedly. If there had not been this advantage of an anti-nihilistic influence on the side of classical learning, we would have thought more, weighed the arguments on both sides, Sergei Ivanovich went on with a subtle smile, and left room for the one tendency and the other. But now we know that the pills of classical education contain the healing power of anti-nihilism, and we boldly offer them to our patients, and what if there is no healing power? He concluded, sprinkling his attic salt. Everybody laughed at Sergei Ivanovich's pills, Turovsin especially loudly and gaily, having at last been granted that something funny, which was all he was waiting for as he listened to the conversation. Stepan Arkadyevich had made no mistake in inviting Pesov. With Pesov, intelligent conversation could not die down even for a moment. No sooner had Sergei Ivanovich ended the conversation with a joke than Pesov started up a new one. One cannot even agree, he said, that the government has such a goal. The government is obviously guided by general considerations and remains indifferent to the influences its measures may have. For instance, the question of women's education ought to be regarded as pernicious, yet the government opens courses in universities for women. and the conversation at once jumped over to the new subject of women's education. Alexei Alexandrovich expressed the thought that women's education was usually confused with the question of women's emancipation and could be considered pernicious only on that account. I would suppose, on the contrary, that these two questions are inseparably connected, said Pesov. It's a vicious circle. Women are deprived of rights because of their lack of education, and their lack of education comes from having no rights. We mustn't forget that the subjection of women is so great and so old that we often refuse to comprehend the abyss that separates them from us, he said. You said rights, said Sergei Ivanovich, who had been waiting for Pesov to stop talking meaning the rights to take on the jobs of jurors, counselors, the rights of board directors, the rights of civil servants, members of parliament. Undoubtedly. But if women can, as a rare exception, occupy these positions, it seems to me that you have used the term rights incorrectly. It would be more correct to say obligations. Everyone would agree that in doing the jobs of a juror, a counselor, a telegraph clerk, we feel that we are fulfilling an obligation, and therefore it would be more correct to say that women are seeking obligations, and quite legitimately, and one can only sympathize with this desire of theirs to help in men's common task. Perfectly true, Alexei Alexandrovich agreed. The question, I suppose, consists only in whether they are capable of such obligations. They'll most likely be very capable, Stepan Arkadyevich put in, once education spreads among them. We can see that... Remember the proverb, said the old prince, who had long been listening to the conversation, his mocking little eyes twinkling. I can say it is in front of my daughters. Long hair, short, exactly the same was the thought of the Negroes before the emancipation, Pesov said angrily. I merely find it strange that women should seek new obligations, said Sergei Ivanovich, which unfortunately, as we see, men usually avoid them. Obligations are coupled with rights, power, money, honors. That's what women are seeking, said Petsov. The same as if I should seek the right to be a wet nurse, 
and get offended that women are paid for it while I'm refused, the old prince said. Tarovsin burst into loud laughter, and Sergei Ivanovich was sorry he had not said it himself. Even Alexey Alexandrovich smiled. Yes, but a man can't nurse, said Pesov, while a woman... No, there was an Englishman who nursed his baby on a ship, said the old prince, allowing himself this liberty in a conversation before his daughters. There will be as many women officials as there are such Englishmen, Sergei Ivanovich said this time. Yes, but what will a girl do if she has no family? Stepan Arkadyevich interceded, remembering Chibisova, whom he had had in mind all the while he was sympathizing with Petsov and supporting him. If you look into the girl's story properly, you'll find that she left her own family, or her sisters, where she could have had a woman's work. Darya Alexandrovna said irritably, unexpectedly entering the conversation, probably guessing what girls to Ponar Cottage had in mind. But we stand for principle, for an ideal, Pesov's objected in a sonorous bass. Women want the right to be independent, educated. They are cramped and oppressed by their awareness that it is impossible. And I'm cramped and oppressed that I can't get hired as a wet nurse in an orphanage, the old prince said again, to the great joy of Sorovsin, who laughed so much that he dropped the thick end of his asparagus into the sauce. If you enjoy this format, please leave a like and subscribe and return tomorrow for the next chapter.